player. Um, and the big difference that I found you know, being in Silicon Valley versus being in Europe is that nobody thinks that way. Everybody thinks, I'm only interested in this if I can be Facebook. I'm only interested in this if I can beat Google. I'm only interested in this if I can beat Apple. That is, that, that, that is, that is the mentality, and it's that mentality that I think we need to encourage. Um, and I think that the services directive would go a massive way towards that because it would open up a huge market of 500 million people, whether it's in crowdfunding, as Bart was talking about, or in other services such as um, uh, such as uh, online local businesses, as we were discussing earlier with um, open corporates, um, uh, the the stimulation that would be that would be given to the market would be absolutely enormous. Um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Commissioner Crows has already been mentioned a couple of times. The last time I was speaking at an event where she was speaking, she was talking about why isn't there a European iTunes? And I think you could ask this, answer the same questions about a lot of other, other verticals. Um, uh, the question of acquisition, you know, why doesn't Google come in? Why don't, doesn't Google and other corporates come in and, and, and buy more European startups? Historically, Google has bought quite a lot of European startups, but it's absolutely true that they buy many more in the US. Um, I think it has to come from the creation of local champions first. It should be big local, big European businesses who are buying European startups. And um, we need to make those big bets that you're talking about in order to create some of those big European players who can then become the exit strategy for the next generation of entrepreneurs. And we've seen some sort of, some moves in that direction. You know, there have been a few big billion dollar, multi-billion dollar successes. Um, but, you know, it's, and maybe it's coming, I'm hopeful. But you know we haven't we haven't sort of gone all of the way to, to having um, uh, you know a real ecosystem of these global global European players, and which would point to the second thing that I talk talk about, which is hubs of expertise, um, and this is something I think where regulation can really play a role and already does play a role, and particular around the universities. So again, it's not just about finance; it's really about the sharing of expertise, um, and uh, you know one of the things that you see all of the time. Um, uh, in, 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 in the US is that if you're you know, talking to a young entrepreneur who may just be out of college, this may be their first startup, um, yes, they know and they're very passionate about their product idea, but they also know where they're going to go to for their angel round and they know how they're going to structure the deal and they know what a convertible note is and they know how much of a runway they're going to get before their next round and how they're going to structure their next round and who they want on their board from the next round and from the third round and all the, and the way, the reason they know all of this is because all their friends are doing it and they all know it. And so it's just part of the culture there. So everybody has this sort of, because you have this very big concentration of expertise, everybody gets this sort of shared sense of knowledge. And that breeds an enormous amount of confidence, which then leads to these sorts of global ambitions um, that we're talking about. Now, we have hubs in Europe, um, uh, and uh, they're, you know, again, I would say in the last 10 years, they've, they've been transformed and they've become much more powerful than they were even 10 years ago. Um, we can do more, I think, by linking these hubs up um, uh, with uh, you know, a coordinated European policy around university funding and around uni uni university support for tech hubs, hubs around support for universities participating in IP that they generate. Um, uh, in order to, you know, one of the things everybody always forgets about Google is that it was actually founded by Stanford. Stanford owns the patent on PageRank. Um, and uh, you know that, that and St Stanford's model is for any inv innovation, you know, a third to the person who came up with the innovation, a third to Stanford, and a third to the licensing, um, the licensing company that takes that forward. Um, so that's another thing that I would point to. Um, and then the third thing is uh, uh, to talk about open data. Um, people have talked quite a bit about open data, and here Europe is sort of ahead. This is Europe is pioneering open data and is in some ways, in, in many areas, you know, ahead of the U.S. Europeana, who are, uh, you know, a, a big partner of ours in the cultural sector, um, have just recently opened up their entire catalog of metadata, about 20 million cultural items from European archive repositories with a CC0 license. They just did that uh, a couple of months ago. And that's going to be huge. That's going to make a thousand... Um, small businesses flower and flourish. And the same is true in, uh, in open data. The one thing I would say about um, open data is release early, release often. Um, uh, sometimes there's a lot of good intentions around open data, but 
um, uh, governments or public sector bodies spend a long time trying to get the data perfect before sending it out there. And I would say just put it out there. Somebody else will clean it up. Somebody else will make it work. Um, uh, releasing early and often is, is usually what works. Um, uh, and that's it. That's all I wanted to say. I'm going to summarize by saying, you know, open access to information. I think the genie's out of the bottle. Um, the news is good in the long term. The services directive, um, uh, full implementation of that, as Bart was echoing as well, will have unbelievably positive effects. Hubs of expertise, we need to continue to invest in them and we need to find ways to join them up across Europe. Um, and, and finally, you know, the open data movement is fantastic. Release early and release often. Thank you. Thank you very much. Omar, do you want to? Sorry. I'm sure I put it on there, but it's not. yeah. Now it would be practical if the chair was a stand-up comedian, but he isn't. is wonderful. I'm going to take us back one step to talk about open access to research information. And Steve just said something lovely, which was that when he was a graduate student, scholarly information became available on the web and how pleased he was to find everything there, he said. Um, it may have seemed like everything to you, <laughs> but it certainly isn't available to everybody. It, uh, most scholarly information now, most journal articles, and many, many, many books are published electronically and are on the web, but they are on the web behind a paywall. And our mission is to break that paywall down and open up the information that's created by publicly funded research to the public that funds it. So when Steve said that he could find the stuff on the web, that's because he was in a university. I'm assuming it was a well-funded university with a good library, which was providing him with access to that information. About two months ago, certainly no more than that, Harvard University Library put out a public statement, which was actually to its faculty, and it said, we can no longer afford to pay for the journals that we have been paying for. We are going to cut, and you're going to have to get used to this idea. Now, Harvard is the best endowed university in the world with the most wealthy library. It has never subscribed to all journals that are published, but it has subscribed probably to about two-thirds of the main journals in the world, and it is now cutting. And if Harvard's cutting, you can see the problem. Journal prices are very high. And um, the publishers have done very little to uh, mitigate that. So that means that even in well-funded universities, there are journals that people can't get access to. In less well-funded universities, there are many journals that people can't get access to. And in poor universities and in areas of the world that we call developing, there are universities where there are hardly any uh, journals that people can access. So open access to research, I'll just 
quickly say what we are talking about there is the free availability of the research literature, preferably right at the time of publication, when those authors who are creators, and they are, Simon, uh, citizen creators and consumers, when they have created that work and they are ready to put it out there for their peers to look at and anyone else, that is the time we want that opened up to the other citizen creators and consumers who can make use of it. Most of those, probably, are academic citizen creators and consumers, but many of them are not. We're talking about something where there are few and preferably actually no restrictions on the reuse of the texts or the data that underlie them. The data that are within the te text themselves I'm talking here about things like the tables, the graphics that are inside the text, lists of numbers, whatever. Other kinds of data sets are published in print on paper, if you like, a facsimile of print on paper, and supporting the text. So scientific experiments or scholarly endeavors are done, and lots of data are now created, and they're all created digitally. But most of those do not make it into a journal publication. That is still very much a summary of what that work was about. So somewhere out there, usually on a desktop, and we were talking about that, usually on a desktop computer or on CDs in somebody's drawer, are the data that were created during that scientific or scholarly endeavor. And we want to see those data opened up for many reasons. First of all, other people can make use of them for themselves. Secondly, they are the means for other scholars in the field to check, verify, and replicate that work. The beneficiaries of doing this are many. They are academic researchers, and, and many people feel that these are the primary beneficiaries, and that may be the case. So access to research articles for those academic scholars who are in universities who cannot afford to buy the journals that they've been published in. Still a major problem, even in the Western world. The education community can, of course, make use of that material directly in, in its work. And then there's something that we call the general public. It's, it's such a, a vague term that it needs some thinking about, but there are many constituencies within that general public that can and will make use of this material if it is made available to them, but that usually it is not available to them. There's industry and commerce in terms of innovative SMEs, and we've been talking about SMEs this afternoon quite a bit. Our study for the Danish government, which asked us to look at this very issue for them, SMEs,